Hey everybody, it's Tom and coming to you this week with the illustrious W.D. James. Uh, you guys may have encountered W.D. James. He's acquired a minor celebrity because he was featured on Dr. Sam Bailey's channel. Uh, she read an essay of his, uh, The Mortal God Drops Its Mask. Um, which essay is featured both on this uh, fine little, uh, by this, the, I shouldn't say little, it's the Winter Oak, doing a lot of very interesting work there. And in addition to Winter Oak, you can find it on Substack, under, I think, your uh, Substack, which is Philosopher's Holler, right? That's right. Philosopher's Holler. Um, and I'm going to, you know, link that stuff in the notes, right? But the theme of that essay, uh, and I encountered WD initially through um, Dr. Bailey as well, is it's sort of highlighting the limitations of modernity, which then segues into a series. I, I think that there's sort of a more explicitly political focus in that initial essay, but it segues into the series, which is about uh, maybe four out of 10 uh, deep in terms of its publication, but an extended series on the emergence of modernity and more specifically, and I'm going to stop talking in a second because I know I can be a chatty Kathy. Um, an essay, not just about modernity, but about a latent tradition of anti-modernity or anti egalitarian anti-modernity because a concern here is that people who uh, assume a stance critical of modernity are oftentimes sort of uh, pigeonholed or conceived illegitimately to fall into a sort of a reactionary camp, a sort of deeply, maybe problematically traditionalist camp, because those are the quarters from which lots of criticism of, criticisms of modernity issue. But this is not just an unfortunate and an unfair circumstance. It's also fundamentally distortionary about how modernity itself emerged and certain traditions which antedate and then it perhaps grow on, albeit in the margins with modernity. So much by way of some uh, introductory remarks. I guess I could turn it over to you, WD. I don't know if you want to say anything else by way of introducing yourself, or if you just want to maybe start by situating the notion of modernity, especially because it's almost like an old-fashioned term now. And what I mean by that is now we're in post-modernity, where you hear a lot of that sort of uh, chatter, the post-modern condition in which we find ourselves and so on. And then it's post-everything, post-truth, post-irony all the rest of it, but let's you know, maybe just back it up a bit to modernity simply. Sure. And uh, first of all, thanks for, for having me on your show here, Tom. It's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Um, so, yeah, so this this particular series of essays in egalitarian anti-modernism, and yeah, at the point we're talking here, four of the 10 essays have been published thus far. Uh, but, you know, yeah, as, as you point out, the, the essential goal there is to first define what, I, what I'm meaning by anti-modernism, which requires defining what you mean by, by modernity, which I, I take a solidly philosophical approach, although then I extrapolate some political and sociological consequences that tend to flow from that as well. Uh, but the, the, the real task is, as you say, to distinguish between uh, what, what I think is a discernible trend or tradition of anti-modern thought, which is egalitarian in nature, and to contrast that with what I label aristocratic anti-modernism, which might be what you allude to is, you know, the more familiar or sometimes, uh, you know, we're tempted to just go, well, that is what it is to be anti-modern is this more reactionary uh, sort of approach. And in, in the essays, I identify that with 
Joseph DeMaestra and Thomas Carlyle starting out probably, and then more 20th century sort of thinkers like Julius Evola, Ernst Junger, and then the contemporary uh, Alexander Dugan are all people I mentioned as, you know, probably falling into that uh, aspect of anti-modern thinking. Uh, but then my my task is to to say that's that's not the whole deal, and uh, there there is a different tradition with different values uh, and a different perspective uh, from which modernity is is critiqued, uh, and to but that is less well known, I think. Uh, so just to to put out there and to establish that there there is this line of thought, and the the people I highlight there in this, you know, we might say counter tradition would, would be people like William Blake and uh, Rousseau uh, starting out. And then people I look at uh, later in the essay series be William Morris, uh, G.K. Chesterton, Yvonne Illich, uh, Leo Tolstoy, and, and several others. Now, one thing, not, just to push it back a little bit further, even historically, because uh, one might be tempted to, to infer that anti-modernism is coeval with the rise of modernism. But in fact, what you are sketching, if I'm following it correctly, precedes the emergence of modernity. And in a sense, you could say that is part of a tension that uh, persists through uh, the Western tradition writ large. But one of the things that you note initially um, is that within a medieval context, <clears throat> there is a prior tension, which you highlight as crucial to what it becomes uh, ideologically, ideationally dramatic about modernity. And that medieval controversy is the debate between nominalism and realism. And there's actually an additional point, which I will bracket for the moment, but uh, to turn that over, you might want to flesh that out. Of what is nominalism versus realism, but then how that connects to the project of modernity sure. itself. And and part of what, what you're talking about points to is that modernity isn't solely uh, a chronological term or issue. It, it has to do uh, with the stance one adopts. And so we can see uh, tendencies or, or movements all the way back to the classical world that uh, would contribute to, to modernity or, or that we, looking back, could go, well, these were seeds of uh, modern thinking all the way back to the Greek atomists or something. Um, and as you point out, I really trace it back to tensions within the medieval context, uh, and specifically people like uh, Abelard and Occam and, and this idea of, of nominalism, which simply means that when we talk about uh, abstract concepts like human or dog that uh, previously people, ha realists, held that those concepts actually referred to something, not something material. That is, humanness isn't material. All the particular humans are, partic are, are material, but that there was really still something that genuinely bound all humans together, that there was a human nature and a human essence. And the, the thrust behind nominalism is, is simply to deny that, to, to say that these are just names, which is which is what the, the Latin means. These are just names that we give to categories or classifications uh, for convenience sake or for clarity sake or for utilitarian purposes, uh, but that there, there is no essence there for behind the word human. Uh, and that really has a lot of consequences, right? If, if we stick with just the example of human, whether we think there is a human nature or a human essence, something that really, truly, genuinely we all have in common, something that binds us together, uh, something shared, or whether we think that there is no such thing, 
plays a huge difference. And in, in the essay series, part of what I do is is flesh out some of the the political implications of that coming in the early modern period 17th 18th century uh where people had to try to figure out well well what is political order then for example if uh human doesn't really mean anything if uh there is no shared nature, no organic connection between us. If we're really just a bunch of individuals whom we lump together intellectually for convenience sake, uh, well, if there is no given order, if there is no given essence or purpose, well, then you have to construct it, right? And constructing order in a myriad of ways is is broadly how I would see the modern project, right? So first you you strip away the, the philosophical basis that established order to begin with, and you get a lot of freedom when you do that, right? A lot of things come open for questioning and changing and manipulating, uh, but you lose a lot too. Uh, so whatever order and purpose there's going to be are going to become human purposes and a human order, a conceptual order, uh, which is a difficult thing to, to do, but. So now as you're speaking, a few things occur. Mm -hmm. One being that uh, proceeding forth from the, the claims of nominalism and, and the claims of a radical nominalist, Whereas obviously this tendency is deeply inspirational for the emergence of contemporary science, which I think can be admitted as a key feature of modernity. The project of science itself is ultimately in tension with radical nominalism structurally because it is predicated on the notion that there is a nature to discover, that there is an order in the world which we can perhaps not completely, but at least partially disclose through assays, efforts, experimentation, and so forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the interrogation of the human, uh, you see, this, this is what it seems that nominalism does is it, it, it seems to abandon positionality regarding the human subject on the one hand, but on the other hand, with what does it replace that? It, it seems that insofar as it's yoked to science, it's replacing it with something. And I think this is maybe where the anthropology of people like Thomas Hobbes comes to bear. Does that, that, does that follow? Or do you want to sort of build on that or respond to that? Yeah, so so a, a couple of things there really. I, very... I, I think I think you're right that there there is a tension between uh, science broadly conceived and a, and a strict nominalism, and and I think really the past hundred hundred and fifty years we see various sciences uh, moving beyond that uh, in different ways. Where where I think there is not a tension where I think there is almost an implication is in the technological application of science. Uh, so here I'm, you know, thinking of our ability to inter uh, interact in instrumental ways with nature, in which case it's, it's probably essential to deny, uh, natural purposes or uh, natural schemes of organization other than causal mechanisms, uh, which, which are essential. Right? You can't have technology unless you have causation, efficient causation. Uh, so that that seems to be all that you want to have left is, is particular, particular uh, entities and their causal relationships uh, so that you're not impeded by uh, a natural purpose, an ethical constraint, uh, any anything like this, right? So you know, I'm thinking along the the lines of of Heidegger or, or or someone here who right who sees 
modern technology is a radical departure from traditional ways of interacting with the world, even when we might describe uh, some of that as technological, the use of tools or, or whatever, but you see something very different going on in modern technology. And what's changed there is that whole frame, right, that, that you're referencing the situation of the human, uh, so that uh, on, on a view like his, uh, the point of modern technology is to uh, reduce all of all of nature, essentially a standing reserve, right? To, to to our purposes, what can it do for us? Standing reserve, he calls it. Um, so while I, I I think you're exactly right that science understood maybe more as as a pursuit of genuine knowledge presumes. Uh, more in nature than than anomalist would, but a technologist, I think, must reduce nature uh, to to something like anomalous position in order to render it fully susceptible to our our instrumental interventions. Does that? Well, I would go further and say that the the radical anomalist, insofar and, and the technologist, I think. Um, are often disposed to see nature as not simply uh, play to be, um, you know, manipulated, but as something which is actively hostile. And I think that this is something which is really another uh, crucial problem with modernity is this deep hostility toward the natural world as a source of suffering death and so forth yeah. and thus descartes you know famously calls for you know lordship and mastery over nature for the you know accentuation of pleasure diminution of pain extension of life perhaps even conquest of death similarly francis yeah. bacon All right yeah. so this uh hostility redounds on the human being Thing insofar as we are a component and part of nature, if we're hostile to nature itself, then it's very difficult to resist a kind of involution. And so this is a, something which has been noted in various ways by several people, like Jacques Ellul, for instance, in his critique of the technological, you know, so we become subsumed as part of the the the, the technological or the technical. Um, and you, know, you could produce other figures as well. Um, so yeah, I would just build on that and note that there's this presumption of antagonism there at the emergence of uh, of modernity. Yeah. Um, and in the political which, realm, I think Hobbes would be the shining example there, right? I mean, right. everything right. we want to get away from that is that is the whole point of human activity is to escape nature to create our our own uh world to live in with uh, the state or leviathan to 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 set the boundaries uh it, i mean leviathan is essentially anti-nature right i mean you, given what we've just said you could summarize what leviathan is that briefly it mm -hmm. is anti-nature it's 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 the human world of artifice uh, as distinct from nature. <laughs> Excuse me. Apologies. Which actually provides us, well, see, the problem is this conversation can go into so many directions because as you were saying that, it also strikes me that there's a resonance with fashion, facets of the Christian tradition, the notion of the garden or expulsion and how this you could get very psychoanalytic as to what's going on there but uh that's a whole other ball of wax the, the, the uh, which to which we might possibly have turned but in also bringing out Hobbes you provide us a segue to a premier critic that and in your essay series uh, Rousseau right mm -hmm. so for uh, Hobbes, uh, the it's the the movement beyond the natural, or the nature, or the wild is considered uh, fundamentally salutary. Whereas with Rousseau, 
the fall from nature. <laughs> the fall is, in fact, seen as deeply problematic. It may be a fait accompli, but it is a kind of degeneration from a sort of pristine human essence. If you want to maybe elaborate on that difference between Rousseau and Hobbes, and then sure. how that relates to the to to what is anti modernism. Yes, yeah, so I mean, in in that sense, Rousseau is is sort of the anti Hobbes, although there are some ways in which they still share uh, certain perspectives. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, our sort of stereotypical view of Rousseau back to nature, uh, he presents the state of nature as a situation in which we're at one with ourselves, we're we're not alienated, we're not inauthentic. We're uh, essentially happy because our relatively simple needs can easily be met. Uh, and to uh, leave that state is is something like a fortunate fall or, or something for, for Rousseau. He doesn't think that we can go back, uh, but where we draw our inspiration from uh, where we draw values from, it's very much rooted in in what he sees as as our nature. Uh, and then it's the artificial uh, condition of of society uh, where most of the problems arise, where we become not one with ourselves. we we have who we are, but then who we project to others uh, socially, uh, sort of our image. Uh, so that there's inauthenticity, we introduce competition, which leads to uh, inequalities uh, and oppression. So he, he really situ situates the the problems that we encounter as social problems, uh, not natural problems, which is essentially the the inverse image of Hobbes, right, who sees all of the problems rooted in, in our natural condition or in our nature, and society is the solution that we uh, contrive to to overcome those uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short lives that we would have by by nature. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, I think just the opposite. Where, where so, so in that sense that Rousseau is looking back towards nature now you know he, he doesn't have i think he's trying to have a more accurate anthropology than hobbes but you know, we would still be pretty skeptical about uh, a rousseauian uh, anthropology at this point and he's not looking back to history really he is still doing uh, modern enlightenment type thinking uh, about this hypothetical state of nature and a hypothetical social contract. He's still in in that realm of discourse. But what's essential there is he, he is looking back to what's deep, what's what's in, in innate to us, what's natural to us, not what are we going to construct. And, and in that sense, he's, in my mind, more aligned with most pre-modern thinkers where the the basic contrast there is the the pre-modern and i, I would say anti-modern stances is, is the main job for humans is to figure out what we are what our nature is what good is and then do that <laughs> whereas uh as i see it the the basic project of modernity is to figure out what do we want and then how do we make the world do that? That's overly simplified, but uh, I think that basic contrast is there, right? Whether whether it's a, a quest for understanding and knowledge and then figuring out how to live a human life in accordance with that, or whether it's at bottom an imposition of our will as to how to make the world accommodate our preferences and our comfort and our desires. So in that way i also think he's structurally he's he's aligned with pre-modern uh thought in that way and then in you know more 
mundane ways. I mean, he he just prefers simpler societies. He he doesn't really prefer uh, French Parisian Enlightenment salons, even though that's where he spends his time and and maybe does prefer it, but that's not what he says he prefers uh, in his writing. Right in his writing, it's it's the natural person, the the savages uh, that are being discovered all over the world. Uh, his term, not mine. Uh, people on the edges of Europe, Poland, places like that, where he, where he thinks uh, Geneva, where where he thinks people are still closer more closely related uh, to our natural form of existence in smaller, simpler societies, more virtuous and happier, ultimately, for him. You're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Um. <laughs> I do think it is important to note that the similarities between um, Hobbes and Rousseau are significant. Um, they're, they're, they're inverse anthropologies notwithstanding. And it, it comes down to, I mean, we talked about this a bit uh, for the show last week, how um, you know, I take a rather dim view of the sort of framework which is established by the social contract with, you know, the general will and so forth as, as Rousseau portrays it. Then, well, basically what he's doing is he's basically doing what Hobbes is doing, except that he, he decenters authority. The locus of authority is no longer vested in a singular individual. Uh, it's, it's, it's centered in new and abstraction, general will. But that very, the very indeterminacy of the general will, I think, creates this liability to despotism, which um, I feel can be connected to the subsequent emergence of, uh, you could say, the to wax Foucaultian, the, the disciplinary society, the surveillance society in which we find ourselves. Um, uh, so I, I just wanted to to put that note in there that uh, Rousseau is a, you know, he's, he's a fantastic writer. You're, you're going to have difficulty, in my view, finding someone who's more engaging and even entertaining to read than Rousseau. Um, but his, his work is, I think, um, marked by contradictions, which uh, which I think we should be very wary anyway i i just uh, so i don't know if you want to respond i think maybe we are essentially on the same page but we just have sort of different weightings of those aspects of the contradiction right yeah i mean certainly rousseau is complex in a number of ways uh and there are uh you know competing competing interests com competing goals and then, and then certainly competing interpretations uh, of Rousseau after the fact, all sorts of things could be uh, traced back to Rousseauian themes. Um, yeah, I, th I think I'm a little more sanguine about uh, Rousseau on the general will and the social contract than you, although that's uh, not what I focus on in the essays because I don't think it's the best uh, or the most interesting Rousseau. Uh, so with the exception of basically one chapter uh, from the social contract, uh, the chapter on civil religion. Um, I don't really talk about the social contract in, in the essays. Um, I, I so think on it, that note, yeah, go ahead. Go on, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think the tension there is, is to to solve the, the problem of, of how we regulate our lives while remaining free, right? And, and he thinks the general will can do that. If, if a polity can discern the true genuine uh, general will and then formulate laws and policies that really reflect it, then in obeying those laws, you would remain in conformity with your own interests and will in a sense. Now, 
obviously the general will is quite an abstraction. We, you know, in politics, we have quite a history of abstractions turning into uh, problematic realities. Um, and I certainly wouldn't deny that that the the potential is there uh, for Rousseauian ideas to lead to the opposite of of what I think was his intention. But at least at a theoretical level, I think that's what he's trying to pull off, much like Kant tried with the categorical imperative, tried to, to pull off a, a way of formulating uh, an, an ethics of duty that when obeying it, we would only be obeying ourselves, and hence autonomy is preserved. Um, yeah, it's not not where I would place my emphasis on either of those uh tricks so to speak um but i think that's i think that I, i'm willing to grant rousseau that that's what he's trying to do is is to reconcile those two things not to uh, surreptitiously introduce despotism or something i don't think that's his intention that could be the result and, and i think that's probably where we agree yes and i don't necessarily think that he was fully appreciate i don't think he was consciously trying to foster that um but i guess to try and bring it back to the root question of uh giving voice to the anti-modern tradition and what ultimately constitutes that's that kind of anti-modernity that you are uh, advocating yeah. um what is distinctively anti-modern about Rousseau, which we've already sort of said it, but just to reiterate it in a more concentrated form. Yeah, well, it, it's essentially his critique of the Enlightenment project going on contemporaneously with him, which he's actually a contributor to as well. So one more way in which Rousseau is complex, right? He's both uh, contrib contributing to the development of modern th Enlightenment thought, but at the very same moment, he's critiquing it, right? So his buddies with uh, the the philosophes who are writing the encyclopedia and all of these things, but he's critiquing them already, right? So in, in from my perspective, it's it's kind of like you you can't get much more of a jump on something than that, right? <laughs> You're both creating it and critiquing it at the same time. So I, I would give uh, Rousseau that honor. So in terms of uh, critiquing the how self-sufficient reason is right so certainly um the enlightenment has a lot of uh, trust and faith in the ability of of reason to be employed to better our our human lot but rousseau's critical of that from the beginning he sees deceptions woven in with reason and he sees reason is not a sufficient motivating power to organize a society around so he introduces these other ideas he gives uh a strong role to things like sentiment and uh, our our conscience. Uh, the, these aren't really modern. Uh, it's not what modernity rests on, right? The, this is an appeal to not something historically pre-modern, uh, but I would say ph philosophically pre-modern, right? In that they're they're deeper than what the enlightenment is trying to get at and, and they involve a critique of uh, the enlightenment project. And then certainly socially and politically, right? He sees uh, the creation of sophisticated complex societies as inherently problematic. And whether he's exactly looking back towards pre-modern or uh, pre-civilizational models, to some extent he is, um, and he's contrasting those favorably with uh, the world being brought about uh, through uh, the Enlightenment. So in those senses, I, I would say that he is uh, an anti-modern thinker. I, I do in the essay say he doesn't have either the perspective or the vocabulary to uh, be completely consistent in that. Uh, and he doesn't seem to be fully aware of all of the philosophical assumptions that that he's actually utilizing, which are largely modern assumptions. Um, but but I, so I would see him. That's how I would position him. He he's his, he gets credit for uh, launching a critique very early, but also because it's very early, he doesn't have the perspective that 
a 19th or 20th or 21st century thinker uh, would have to sort of mind their P's and Q's in avoiding falling into nominalism and these sort of things. So I think uh, what strikes <coughs> me there is the importance of conscious, right? The, the, that his, his, his position that human beings are possessed of a kind of moral intuition that is not simply um, uh, an outcome of uh, relative cultural or social conditioning. Um, and in that sense, that kind of is what, is that what in a way connects Rousseau to pre-modern critiques or, or to realism? Is that the realist aspect of Rousseau that he's willing to put the cards on the table and say that human beings do have something like a sense of the moral or the ethical, which is not just um, pretense? For sure. So, and, and ultimately traces that back to uh, sort of the pre-moral sentiment of of pity, right, which, which he takes to be uh, as deeply rooted in our nature as anything. So first, he, he really thinks there uh, is a substantive uh, human nature, and, and it's in that pity side that that goes beyond, uh, say, a Hobbesian or Lockean account of an atomistic individual, right? So he admit uh, Rousseau admits with Hobbes and Locke that we have this innate uh, desire and and uh, goal of self-preservation that can lead to conflict. So that that's definitely Hobbes' uh, starting point to some extent. Locke's, uh, but equally deeply rooted is what we might call a moral sense or a proto-moral sense, um, which. Uh, makes us uh, want to avoid suffering amongst others of our kind, right? So, so there is this something built into us that forms a genuine connection between uh, all human beings, right? So, so there's a more substantive view of what a human is, what human nature is, and there are at least the, the seeds of our being able to exist socially in a cooperative manner uh, because of this innate uh, desire to avoid the suffering of others or to you know, not, not impose unnecessary suffering on others. So I think that's, that's part of his anti-modernism. You know, I, I think, and I talk about this in, in the last of the essays on Rousseau, um, what Wiley is pretty much operating within an enlightenment deist uh, framework for religion and, and theology. Um, he, he sees it as essential uh, that we accept uh, that we accept uh, the existence of a divinity and that that uh, divinity is essentially, uh, moral and will undergird uh, our moral intuitions uh, because because he doesn't have the the faith that, that reason alone will either establish that truth or provide sufficient motivation for us to uh, act according to uh, moral norms even even if they're innate to us. Um, so I, I do, and that's maybe a more controversial reading, but I, I do read Rousseau as. Uh, having uh, some genuine theological presuppositions um, that he sees as necessary to his project. And then he brings those up in the social context in, uh, on the social contract uh, as providing the necessary basis, he says, to uh, make men love their duty. Um, so what he's interested in there is, he, so he believes that duty is real. He believes that's uh, given that it's objective, that we really do have social obligations to one another, uh, but that uh, reason alone is not sufficient uh, to get us to recognize those or to act in accordance with uh, those moral obligations. And there are 
essentially two or three theological presuppositions he thinks that are useful and not contrary to reason uh, that need to be affirmed in order to undergird a, a wholesome life. Yeah. yeah. So I just wonder, well, I was going to ask another question. We could, one could talk about Rousseau all day because he's a thinker of sufficient breadth to demand our attention uh, at that length. Um, with regard to his theological suppositions, he puts them out there, but it, I mean, are they not rather proffered in a somewhat schematic, almost ad hoc fashion? So you have the idea that the 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 religion or the deity existing pretty much as a placeholder, well, which to me is pretty unsatisfying. I'm not really interested in relying on a mere contrivance to uh, conduce to some sort of social order. I mean, that to me drives us back to to Hobbes or, or whatnot. Um, but it's, 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 it's difficult to say. It's difficult to say. Well, well if he didn't think that the theological presuppositions were true, then, then that would be uh, a proper critique. And when he's discussing in the context of a civil religion, he is explicitly talking about the, the political utility of, of these beliefs, but he talks about these other places in, in the Emil, for instance, uh, and it seems to be his genuine view that for us to trust either our reason or our moral sentiments presupposes uh, uh, a benevolent deity. Maybe not much more than that, right? We, we might not need a very long list of, of attributes to ascribe to a divinity, but uh, we essentially can't function and can't achieve happiness uh, unless we trust our reason to tell us about the world and unless we trust our consciences to tell us about what's right. right? We could be skeptical about both of those points to, to no end. Um, so, so I think he sees that as a genuine necessity. Now, whether that's, you know, just utilitarian justification of, of God or, or not, I don't, I mean, in a sense it is because that's how he's arguing, but I, I get the sense that, uh, he has a genuine commitment to, uh, a deity with, with those basic attributes, which also is, I mean, deism is is a modern notion. Um, so in that sense, he's going along with the Enlightenment. But again, I, I think his reading of that is is different from someone like a Voltaire uh, or even a Locke uh, <laughs> or a Jefferson uh, in that uh, he seems to think for, for us to even have a world that makes sense presupposes something above the world that guarantees those things. Which is really a somewhat <laughs> proto-Kantian position. Because, I mean, Certainly my understanding Kant, uh, of Kant uh, basically yeah. takes that tact with reference to the God is, is sort of a regulative concept. But instead of going forward, I was actually going to go backward because the structure of what we're... Yeah discussing in some ways is foreshadowed millennia ago with another book the republic or not just the book the republic but with plato you talk about this as well that in this tension here between modernism modernity and anti-modernism anti-modernity is already sort of embryonic within the text of the republic within the discourses in ancient philosophy I don't know if you'd like to say more about that. Sure. Um, spe specifically, uh, you know, in the in the essay I wrote on the Republic, what I was most interested there was trying to find the origin, the philosophical origin of an idea of essentially an organic society, right? Uh, Turnus uh, Gemeinschaft or something. Uh, wh where does that idea first first come up 
of essentially you know a natural egalitarian uh, harmonious uh, social existence uh, and I think it can be traced back to at least Plato's Republic specifically in in the first city uh, that he outlines there in book two of the Republic which is the one we always forget about and uh, we worry about the the second city, the Republic itself, uh, which he describes as a feverish city. Uh, and I suggest that we should take that first, uh, the description of that first city seriously. Uh, the character of Socrates in the dialogue says we should, says it is in fact the good society, uh, but only when uh, his other interlocutors insist uh, that he have a way of bringing in luxury and, and some other uh, goods, does he agree to give them an account of uh, a feverish city, which is essentially structured in order to overcome the, the inconveniences and the, the evils, essentially, that will be introduced uh, by admitting those things into the city so the first thing you need is is an army and so you know goes on and on then about developing the the auxiliaries and the guardian class uh, but my essential point there was that we should take that that first description as 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 a serious description not uh, not a throwaway uh and that we should can at least entertain the notion that that plato actually means it because if he didn't mean it he could have well left it out um you know, didn't need to be there for dramatic purposes i don't think um so there's a reason it's there uh and it can it's not inconsistent with uh anything in plato that i'm aware of that he would prefer uh a simple virtuous society uh seems completely consistent uh with his overall thinking not seeing anything in socrates that would mediate against that. Socrates uh, isn't necessarily a fan of uh, luxurious cosmopolitan uh, civilization per se. So. No, but I think the tension is that even if it's acknowledged in the Republic that the second city is a feverish one, I find it hard to escape the impression that there's at least a kind of apology for the structures which he's uh, recommending there. Uh, I, I find it difficult to, to see the text as being merely ironical in its articulation of uh, developing uh, this eugenic, really um, quasi-meritocratic hierarchy that's uh, gated and 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 uh, so in, and in which uh, actively deceives its um, constituents vis-a-vis -vis the so-called noble lie and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so there, but in many ways, it anticipates the problem of modernity, um, in that you have. Uh, no, it, 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 I how can I put it? Um, what is the specific point of analogy which I'm sort of intuiting here between how things are set up there? And it actually, in a way, almost puts me in mind of the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky, uh, um, where the, the 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 hypocrisies are seen as necessary in order to provide stability. And yes, there is a better way. But it's so unbelievable that we can not count upon it. In fact, we almost have to presume that it is impossible and reject those who would advocate for it as uh, themselves the true enemies of the state and thus of the people. Hmm. So, uh, um, yeah, well, Plato isn't optimistic about the uh, prospects of, of a republic as he discusses in all the later books uh right i mean he calls well, it a, I, I, don't, I don't i i don't know I, have I have to go personally i don't know so um and he gives the laws he gives how regimes decay and uh i mean that's that's how he sees the 
the course of human ventures is that uh you know our origin is sort of the high point and then the natural tendency of things is to decay um so he's not completely even in after book two of the republic he's not really sanguine about the prospects of either establishing or maintaining a genuinely virtuous regime uh, i think polities tend to decay but i mean i i forgive me if i'm it's been a while right and uh of course it's certainly possible i was incorrect um i just uh but again you said plato in any event is an ancient as opposed to a modern right and uh, that is a distinction which can map on to the modern anti-modern controversy um but i don't know that might be too complex of a thing to take on at this exact moment uh but perhaps not right um you uh you're using Plato in the essays to indicate that there is this tradition mm -hmm. that antedates um, my, the, thus, you know, it's not simply a chronological category, but also is something that pertains to certain styles of thought, which in a way show up everywhere in history, albeit in different registers. Um, well, I think that where, where that tension shows up in Plato is probably in the the character of Thrasymachus, in, also in the Republic, uh, the defender of the proposition that justice just is the interest of the stronger, right? Which is a very modern idea that it's ultimately power that decides things, including what will be counted as just and unjust. I mean, that's that's a Hobbesian uh, position already. And, you know, in, in that dialogue, Thrasymachus is, is representing the, the the sophists the rhetoricians uh, who uh, Plato accuses of being more interested in persuading people than in knowing the truth right so already the emphasis there is on meeting human ends what what do we want to accomplish and then how do we persuade people to follow that course of action that's a very modern notion I would I would suggest and and so you know Plato is is opposing that with uh, you know, true philosophy, the love of wisdom. Uh, but yeah, so I think at least in Greek society, that that tension was already there, at least as Plato saw it, right? Those who were acting more instrumentally, those who were uh, not seeking to conform to some sort of genuine uh, morality, but who were seeking to serve their own interests, create the world as they wanted it to be created through the power of persuasion. I think that's a very modern notion. So would you say that modernity or modernism or the modern is fundamentally Thrasymachian? Yes. I mean, to the extent that it, that, that that's present in Plato, I, I, I think that's where that modern approach shows up most clearly in the Republic is in the character of Thrasymachus. I, 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 I'm sort of tempted to really run with that. And uh, the way it shows up even in now is, is in our deeply problematic relationship with the category of truth, right? Um, is there truth? And, uh, you know, now, you know, at the beginning of the conversation, I alluded to, you know, oh, everything is postmodern, post-truth. And some of those phrases are throwaway and, and sort of just kind of uh, trendy and can be dismissed. But they still sort of reflect a, 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 a paradigm which has a certain cultural potency that dismisses the true as a category um, of fundamental naivete. In fact, it, 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 and uh, when you dismiss the true as simply a kind of naivete, you basically are justifying this Thrasymachian position, which I think receives a sort of uh, relatively explicit apology in the figure of Machiavelli. Um, 
who ironically advocated for a Republican form of government, um, at least <laughs> in, in, in a sense. Um, all right. So then if it's established that the modern position is essentially Thrasymbican in character, that the true and the just are the 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 determination of um, the strong, then what really is constitutive of anti-modernity is the notion that there is a truth and a justice which abides regardless of uh, the category of the strong. Is that is that coherent? You, yeah, you, yeah, I think so. Here? Yeah, I think so. Now, I mean, which which raises. Uh, a complication here if, if we're thinking in terms of anti-modernism because that, that that can't just be a return to pre pre-modern ways or pre-modern certainties uh you know you you don't go back um but it involves a rejection fundamentally of that modern move right which can be presented you know i pr present did earlier in terms of the shift towards nominalism, we we could equally well put it in these Thrasymachian terms, which you know I teach a class essentially claiming that Machiavelli, Hobbes, Nietzsche, Carl Schmitt, and Foucault are are in some sense the children of Thrasymachus. There. Uh, defending uh the guy who lost back in antiquity um so so you could you could equally describe it that way i i think as as the move towards centralizing power that could be both human power in the form of technological control of nature or it could be political power in terms of uh the control of narratives truth uh, populations right the state yeah, I, th I th that being I said, so yeah. like you, sorry to interrupt, but you like raise this the, the the you invoke Nietzsche, right? And um, I think that Nietzsche is anti-modern. Nietzsche is not uh, a lover of modernity. He's a uh, a vocal and potent critic of modernity, right? So. Even though there are aspects which of of his thought which are almost unavoidably Thrasymachian, he's not Thrasymachian in the same way as Thrasymachus. Uh, in part because I think Nietzsche retains the the idea of an authentic nobility, whereas Thrasymachus is just a crass cynic. Right. The problem is that our capacity to access an authentic nobility has right. been vacated by the vagaries of modernity. And so now we have to come and recreate our values, which is so immense a task that the merely modern person is incapable of it. And thus the overman, the ubermensch is going to come. And right. So so uh the reason I kind of want to jump on this point yep. is because you noted that. And I think maybe Nietzsche is a useful exemplar of their position, that there are, as you say, aristocratic mm -hmm. anti-moderns. And would you say that Nietzsche is yeah. such a figure? Or am I uh so what do you say what do you say to that? Yeah, so you know, honestly, I'm I, I'm not sure whether I think Nietzsche is essentially modern or anti-modern. Uh I do mention, actually, I think it's probably not until the 10th essay, which you won't have had a chance to read yet uh, that uh, arist with the, the people I term aristocratic anti-moderns do tend to draw on Nietzsche, uh, whether he's exactly anti-modern or not. Uh, they find inspiration there, and it's exactly the point that that you're making: some authentic notion of nobility, right? Uh, whether that's what what I think is a pretty problematic conception of nobility uh in the genealogy of morals with uh you know the <laughs> the, the raging blonde beasts and all that that, that can become problematic pretty darn quick uh or whether I mean, it's 
Um, it's weird, actually, when you like read it for the first time. You're like, yeah. oh, where is this coming from? But it's, uh, or, or whether it's you know, may, maybe uh, uh, a version that we might want to entertain more of you know having the the strength to create oneself to create uh values um in in that sense though i i think nietzsche is still pretty modern right i mean that that is what modernity is about is shaping the world and then ultimately ourselves uh as we will so I'm not sure there. There are anti-modern strands in Nietzsche. He certainly rejects uh, much of bourgeois modernity, for sure, especially the values. Um, but but for sure, people that I term aristocratic anti-moderns, thinking you know, very strongly, Ernst Jünger there would be, be a prime example, uh, draw heavily on, on that Nietzschean uh, creative spirit, uh, the emphasis on will there um in responding to what they see as the corruptions or decadence of uh the modern world you know uh, well i mean to be fair i don't think anybody can put nietzsche in a box right he's he he's he's a, he's a, he's, a, he's a thinker that he's 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 a, he's a moving target he's thought he evolved and at no point is he is part of the beauty and power of nietzsche um, but it just it, it was interesting that his name came up in connection mm -hmm. with your sort of uh, um, sort of uh, characterization of Thrasymbian th progeny. Uh, let me ask you: This is like this is like this is somewhat of a non sequitur. But let me ask you this: What about Shakespeare? Do you think that Shakespeare is a modern or anti-modern? Of course, it's kind of uh, fair to sort of put it in those terms, right? But what do you think? Uh, all right, I'm certainly not a Shakespeare scholar. Uh, so well, I'm not a scholar either. And then... You know, I, I would be gladly be. But we're just having fun here. So. But my my understanding of Shakespeare, though, is that many of his presuppositions are, for example, his metaphysical presuppositions, are ones that we would associate with with the pre modern world. Uh, that he does have some conception of the great chain of being operating behind the scenes um i don't know how to prove that or point to examples in shakespeare and i could i could be wrong i'm just going uh but but that's how i have heard him discussed anyway in terms of this sort of almost neoplatonic renaissance uh framework which I mean, it's almost too early to go. Is that modern, anti-modern, pre-modern? It's 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 when things are shifting. Um, I don't think we could well, say kind of... anti-modern because I don't know that he would have enough conception of a modernity to have rejected it. Um, I see. I, I I just I actually think he's. I would put him in the tradition that you are sketching as an egalitarian anti-modern that and, i need to study him more. and i mean the it shows up all over the place but where i really think it shows up is in hamlet and there are passages of hamlet like the, the really like a crucial passage is of the quintessence of man um monologue right look you this sky this brave or hanging man. <clears throat> Fred with golden fire, where appeareth to me no the thing that a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man, how noble and reason, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But what is he but a quintessence of dust? So, like this is a crucial passage to me, which says Shakespeare prophetically saw the issues endemic to emergent modernity and rejects them. That the, I also think it shows up in 
though I don't know his histories as well, but I think it shows up in the implicit politics of his histories because of the incredible sort of human treatment he gives to these various figures. Um, so, I mean, it was really just kind of like a softball, like, oh, let's have some fun. Yeah. Modern yeah. anti-modern. You, you've modern probably convinced me I need to go reread Hamlet because I... I haven't read any Shakespeare in many years, and I certainly haven't read him through the lenses that I'm currently thinking in. So, so I, I will do that. I you're probably right. I hope you're right. Right? It'd be nice to have Shakespeare on your side. Uh, so, <laughs> I hope you're right. I definitely want him on the team. So, um, but uh, I was, you know, Shakespeare's fantastic, right? Um, but. Uh, Speaking of people contemporaneous, and as long as we're playing this kind of game, contemporaneous to Shakespeare, what about Milton? Milton. Modern, anti-modern. Mm. Um, I mean, he's certainly held to be modernizing in much of his advocacy of political reform. Uh, but that that doesn't necessarily settle the case. I mean, many of the Rousseau certainly was interested in political reform as well as our Morris and G.K. Chesterton, people that I talk about later in the essay series. Um, I I I, th I think I think Milton is a realist, but again, we're with poets, and that's not my uh. Not my fault. Yeah, I know. Yet, I wasn't I trying to like, put you on the spot or realist. So. Um, and I, yeah, and it's, yeah, you 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 can't hardly describe Satan <laughs> without being a realist because otherwise it's awfully hard to say why he's bad. So you almost have to have a, a pretty solid metaphysics to have a place in it that would be the lowest, the lowest rung of existence. Um, yeah. You have to have a pretty pretty but, rough metaphysics to do that. Yeah. But he's he's interesting because I think you're right. I think he is ultimately a realist and thus it maybe not strictly anti-modern, but in tension, deep tension with modernity. But his account of Lucifer is so sympathetic that it's difficult not to see yeah. him as <laughs> almost wanting him to be right. And in that respect, I think there's, but maybe I don't know Milton well enough, but anyway, so. Well, certainly that's what, back on track. Yeah, we'll people, go well, on. you know, so maybe maybe the tension's just there, right? Maybe the tension's there in the form of Satan, right? In that Milton does seem to be able to find admirable traits, right? And Satan is a rebel and Milton's a rebel. I mean, literally, right? I mean, he's, with Cromwell uh, on the side of Parliament during the the Civil War in England, there and they're the rebels. Um, he can't be unaware <laughs> that it's Satan who's the rebel angel, not not Michael. <laughs> uh, so. Oh. oh, so but um, but to come back to sort of like we go to move towards sort of. Uh, at least the provisional resolution to this question of um, nobility. And we talked about it a little bit vis-a-vis -vis Nietzsche. And he has this curious conception in some quarters, but in other quarters, understandable sort of proto-existentialist sense of nobility that shows up and, and is important for people like said, Junger, maybe Evola, um, and some other figures as well that are sort of, uh, and as you know, the aristocratic critics yeah. of modernity. Yeah. But there, I think, is an other effort to recuperate the notion of the modern that shows up and someone like C.S. Lewis or G.K. Chesterton or J.R. Tolkien, right? Um, for example... Lewis provides a description of the chivalric as a category which emerges from the medieval milieu as, um, as an orientation 
which incorporates the insights of the of Christianity um, into a world which has to struggle with its own duality, the duality within a man between urges toward violence and the imperative toward uh, the gentle and uh, the kind, right? So uh, we talked a little bit about that with Michael Martin in like trying to excavate the chivalric real. I don't know if in your sort of catalog of uh, important thinkers for egalitarian anti-modernism, you have thought much or have any, uh, in terms of any notions in terms of who or what they offer with respect to trying to uh, create this this alternative or this sort of uh, renaissance of something like a, a nobility. Sure. Um, and, you know, certainly, yeah, I agree with you on, on Lewis there. And I, and I have no problem seeing him as essentially an anti-modern thinker. He's extremely critical, especially of technology and its impact on the human as you know, the abolition of man and that hideous trend, you know, thinking of that, that period and that set of ideas, especially um, really has in, in, to my mind, one of the, one of the more profound uh, metaphysical critiques of of technology, um, and yeah, I, I would think of uh, Lewis as, as a Christian humanist, essentially, right? Um, which is a positive project, uh, and I would see it as running counter to uh, the modern world. So I think that could certainly be a constructive. Uh, approach to build uh, something better out of modernity. I don't think it's the only way for sure. Um, but this gets back to a comment I was going to make, make before. Yeah, so so the problem is then, what what is the goal then, right? It, it can't really be going back to something pre-modern. That would technically be reactionary, right? So that could be, uh, you know, it's De Maistre's, uh so let's, well let's let's go back to monarchs let's let's, let's work in this republican yeah. thing you know, this democratic thing and mm -hmm. just leave that behind us uh it's not you especially the further along in time you go that's not going to appear to be a very realistic option to just turn the clock back and that's not what i'm advocating i don't think that's what any of the the folks i talk about in in the essay are talking about but you know it's it is a real problem, right? Because you you can't just act like the modern world didn't happen, right? And we have the problems around truth, around power that we have for reasons. Uh, and they don't just go away when you go, well, I'm, I'm just rejecting modernity. Well, those were still real problems. We're, we're still kind of hung up on those. We, we need some answers to those. Uh, and the answers don't come pre-packaged when you when you say, "Well, I'm anti-modern." That means these things all go away. You don't have to be nominalist anymore. <laughs> well, how, how you recover, you know, philosophically, how you recover a realist metaphysics is is not an easy task, right? Uh, that you identify that or something like it as the goal is helpful uh, and might point you in in a constructive direction. Uh, but you know, a whatever comes out the other side of modernity for an anti-modern is not going to be the same as as the pre-modern world, right? It might carry forth some values that were archaeologically dug up and brought forward as valuable, precious things. Uh, but it'll be how do we find new ways? And that's what I, to some extent, I hear you suggesting Nietzsche might have been doing, uh, at least in terms of uh, genuinely noble values. Uh, well, what what might that look like if if we reject bourgeois liberal nineteenth century modernity? How might those reappear in the world? Um, Nietzsche is not going to be my uh, the person I'm most following for constructive advice. That's you know, maybe kind of a personal personal thing. I'm not. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, uh, it's it's it, nor I, nor, I nor a lot, me, uh, especially as a diagnostician, right. uh, as a right, as a 
prescriber, uh, I think it's awfully easy to go wrong with with Nietzsche. Um, right. But yeah, so that's that's an open question, and I don't have a cookie cutter answer, right? It, it'll be a human creative project, and we will have to find. I think if we're going to have a good future, it's it's going to involve finding a way to reestablish and relive some of these more fundamental human values, right? Ass discovering again that that there is a human nature, right? And we're going that and any view of that's going to have to take account of Darwin, right? Which, at least from many readings, the whole point is to get rid of the idea of any sort of fixed uh, species natures there. Um, so it's not going to be an unproblematic uh, project, uh, but you know it seems still the 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 big move is is to admit that the modern uh, move was largely a mistake or at least had very tragic consequences, uh, and that doesn't really make you postmodern in the sense that you you mentioned earlier, uh, which really I just see as you know along with people like Frederick Jameson, I think really just see that as modernity living itself out until through right. entropy yes, it becomes nothing or something um so that's not what i'm you know it would be technically postmodern situation but not what we mean by postmodern um but yeah what exactly that looks like who knows i mean lewis is is creative in thinking along those lines i think gk chesterton's creative in thinking along those lines you know, Morris has a sort of almost medieval socialism that he wants to uh, put out there. Uh, and whether we really get a chance to uh, just construct this to our liking is, is probably unlikely because the world's not going to sit still uh while we set about <laughs> settling all these questions and creating whatever vision of the world it is that uh we come up with more likely you know personally I, th I think our world's in quite a bit of trouble and i think it's quite unstable uh so i think really the the next probably century will be a whole lot of reacting to whatever uh instabilities and opportunities that instability uh throws at us and if we can bring some genuine tested humane values to our responding to that i'd be pretty happy with with that uh you're more likely to get a good world out the other end uh than if you don't have access to those values well i i i concur and really we just scratched the surface here because there's you know we never even for instance brought up the question of class you know, the importance of Marx historically and, and conceptually Marxism or the, the, the socialist project altogether, the revolutionary Absolutely. tradition. Um, we haven't even really touched that stuff, I mean, except implicitly, right? So we'll have to sort of follow up with more than that. But the issue of humane value and the, the importance of recovering a, a realist metaphysics is in my view intimately linked to realizing something like uh, moral energy again i think that the, 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 we live in a climate of remarkable despondency because the idea of being you know they say god is dead but perhaps it's almost more accurate to say that morality is dead yeah. and how do we recover a sense of um a real energetic relationship with something like justice yes. or kindness or truth yeah. Um, yeah. without just treating it as an ad hoc convention. And that's why realism is important because it says it's not just an ad hoc convention. Right. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, the irony is that the first thing that dies after God dies is man, mankind. Right. Uh, what, what, what are we? right if if there isn't a human nature what are we well we're whatever we want to be i guess but as lewis pointed out what that means in practice is we are whatever those with power condition us to be 
right? And if if they don't have humane values, it's all gone. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So it's you know if you work backwards, you you need some sort of metaphysical basis to get to the ethical. I think I completely agree with you. Well, maybe that's a nice sort of point to sort of adjourn. Um, and we can maybe do another one as more of your essays come out because you only four oh, of your wishes of us talk and uh, so on. So, and, uh, you know, get this up probably tomorrow uh, and I'll send you the links and all that stuff. Um, is there anything else you would like to say before we sign off for the evening? No, just thank you again for uh, taking the time to do this. Gra glad you came across the... Uh... Dr. Sam video. That was a very fortunate thing. Good, good folks. She and her husband out there in uh, New Zealand. Uh, it's gotten a lot of people to, to check out the essays, which I appreciate. Uh, again, I point people to, to winneroak.org.uk uh, to, to see those and a lot of yeah. other great stuff. And then my Substack uh, philosophers holler. Basically the essays are published simultaneously roughly on both places. Lock and roll. So, and uh, I need to reach out to uh, Paul. Uh, is Sudanek or Kudanek? Kudanek, yeah. Kudanek. Oh, Kudanek. Um, at White Oak, you know. So, um, being being also an anarchist. <laughs> so, um, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it there for the night. Thank you again, WD. And uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, Tom. So, all right. Ciao.